Good evening. Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, <laughs> welcome to Cranbrook Art Museum. I'm Andrew Blavelt, the director. Um, we're in, uh, in we're going to have a really wonderful evening. I've seen parts of this before in different places around the country. Um, we're kind of winding up, though, I think, right, ladies? Yes, but um, the best for last, right? Uh, the beginning to the end, <laughs> the origin story. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, today's conversationalist, and I will turn it over to Susan to introduce tonight's uh, guest of honor. Um, so uh, Louise Sandhouse is the former chair of and teaches in the graphic design program at California Institute of the Arts, where, we sh where she received her MFA in graphic design. Uh, Louise also pursued postgraduate studies in design at the Anne van Eyck Academy in the Netherlands. That's where I think we first met many years ago. Um, she is a former AIGA national board member and former chair of the AIGA Design Educators Community, Community Steering Committee. Uh, Louise's work and writing have appeared in numerous publications, including California Designing Freedom, The Women of Design, Information Design Handbook, as well as Metropolis Magazine. Her work is in the permanent collections of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Her book on the most ecstatic and distinctive California graphic design, uh, appropriately named Earthquakes, Mudslides, Fires, and Riots, <laughs> I think that was all last week, um, <laughs> or most of it. Uh, California and Graphic Design, 1936 to 1986, was published in 2014 and received laudatory attention from the New York Times, The Guardian of London, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. And in 2015, it received the Palme d'Argent from the International Art Book and Film Festival. She is currently working on the People's Graphic Design Archive, a crowdsourced virtual archive intended to preserve, expand, and diversify graphic design history. Well, joining us uh, also this evening is Kat Katmer, um, is a graphic designer and illustrator originally from the UK and is currently based in California or on loan, I think as she, your website says, <laughs> you're on loan, a <laughs> long-term loan to California. Her work uses language, typography, and emerging technologies to explore ideas and alternative possibilities for communication. She has designed for various artists, musicians, filmmakers, and commercial enterprises, as well as the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. Kat teaches design and typography at Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles, and is an, also an MFA graduate of the program in graphic design at CalArts. She is currently working on an illustration series exploring the history of California graphic design. So both Kat and Louise are the authors of A Colorful Life, Jerry Cavanaugh, Designer, a remarkable book on a remarkable designer with Cranbrook roots. Copies are available from the shop upstairs if you haven't already received a copy, and we'll have a, a book signing afterwards. We, I think we warned you about that, Jerry. <laughs> so we'll be able to sign copies of it. Um, so I'm, at this time, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage Susan Ewing, who's the Maxine and Stuart Frankel Director of Cranbrook Academy of Art, who will introduce our special guest of honor this evening, Jerry Cavanaugh. Susan. Good evening. The Distinguished Alumni Award is one of the highest honors bestowed by the Academy it recognizes graduates who have demonstrated creativity, innovation, leadership, and vision through their contributions to the practices of architecture, art, and design, as well as to the Cranbrook Academy of Art. Past recipients of the award include Annabeth Rosen, Ceramics of 81, MacArthur Binion, Painting, 73, Peter Bolin, Architecture, 61, Ruth Adler Schnee, 46, Niels Different, Design of 40, uh, 54, Ann Wilson, Fiber 72, Donald Lipsky, Ceramics 73, and Ed Fella, Design of 87. Tonight, we are here to honor one of the first women to earn an MFA from Cranbrook in 1952, Jerry Cavanaugh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
stay for me in more ways than one. And so I had a very tough time, but I got into Cranbrook, and if it hadn't been for Cranbrook, of the mind thinking and the mindset, I wouldn't have accomplished what I have accomplished. And so I'm saying thank you very much. And also, on top of that, I knew Peggy Giselle and Albert Giselle very well. I used to hang out at Peggy Giselle's gallery on Maple called the Little Gallery. And when I finally got to work and got some money, I went to J.L. Hudson's and bought things that Albert had brought back to the store <laughs> <laughs> to sell. It was incredible. And secondly, or thirdly, the chair that Louise is going to prompt me more about it than I'm sitting in, which is a Breuer chair. I chrome plated on my first job out of at General Motors Styling, which was an arm of GM, but it was associated with uh, the Saarinen office, and I was basically a general flunky between the Saarinen office and General Motors Textile. And so, and I have loads of stories about it, but I think these two ladies want to say something, and I'll tell you more later if you <laughs> ask. And I'll tell you more in a moment, but I think while Jerry is standing, maybe I will seize the moment and, and go ahead and give you your award, and then I'll talk about you a little bit. Thank you. I'm going to wind up crying, Susan. <laughs> and cat shoot. <laughs> By the way, I grew up with two very humorous parents, and so the apple hasn't fallen very far, and I'll make for them hard. Well, I'll just tell a little bit of the story from the Cranbrook perspective, and you may you may have much more to add from the California perspective. Oh, I, oh but, I'll, but you, after, so she later. graduated, she graduated, <laughs> one of the first MFAs, and after graduation, as she mentioned, she went on to work at General Motors, where she was part of a design team coined the Damsels of Design by Harley Earl. She left G, now that's probably, a, that could be a whole lecture in itself, I think, yep. but at any rate. She left General Motors to work in the Detroit offices of the shopping mall pioneer, Victor Gruen, who eventually sent her to the firm's Los Angeles office. She has lived in California ever since. In the 1960s, she struck out on her own and opened Jerry Cavanaugh Designs. There, she designed textiles, furniture, toys, graphics, home, store, and restaurant interiors, holiday decor, housewares, and public art, even designing and curating exhibitions, and one of her greatest achievements was the design of the Research Center for the Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. When asked, what do you like to design best? Kavanaugh has replied, anything I can get my hands on, just ask me. <laughs> Over the course of her career, Jerry influenced the design industry and the field of architectural color. And in 2016, she received the Ladislav Sutner Prize in Pilsen, Czech Republic. The prize is awarded to outstanding practitioners and institutions in the design and art fields by the Ladislav Sutner Faculty of Design and Art of the University of West Bohemia. She received the award due to her extensive and outstanding career in textiles, furniture, interiors, exhibitions, and graphics. Also in 2016, Kavanaugh received the AIGA Medal, recognizing her prodigious and polymathic approach to design. The AIGA Award is one of the most prestigious awards in design, awarded to individuals in recognition of their exceptional achievements, services, or other contributions to the field of design and visual communication. 
Her work is in the permanent collections of the Los Angeles Mu County Museum of Art, the Pratt, Pratt Institute, the Fashion Institute of Technology, the American Textile Museum, and Brooks Memorial Art Gallery. Recently, a Cranbrook alumnus, a fellow who graduated in 3D design some years after Jerry, endowed a scholarship, the Jerry Cavanaugh Scholarship, to honor Jerry, a designer he admired throughout his career. He also wanted to recognize the excellence of this woman designer, feeling that women designers are less recognized than their male counterparts. I'd like the first recipient of the Jerry Cavanaugh Scholarship, Karen Lee, a student in Scott Klinker's 3D Design Department, to please stand and be recognized. Can we raise the lights, please? Yay. May you have as wonderful a career as Jerry has enjoyed. And now, Jerry has received her award, and it was my tremendous honor to, to spend time with you this week and to uh, have you return to Cranbrook and, and to be myself personally moved by your passion and force. You are a force of nature. And on behalf of the Cranbrook Academy of Art, I congratulate you and thank you. May the conversation now begin. <laughs> Jerry, this is really special for us to be here. Um, and we want to thank Sarah, uh, Doty, Andrew, Susan, all for having us here. Um, we know how important this place has been in Jerry's career. We're going to unpack some of this, some of the things that she's done throughout that illustrious career. So, oh. and we're delighted to be here to sit today to celebrate Jerry and her lifetime of quite remarkab remarkable creative production. So yes, firstly, uh, Louise and I will have a chat with Jerry about her work, and then we will open up for a Q&A, and then we'll have the book signing just over there afterwards. Jerry, did you say a few words? Are we good? Can we go on? I don't already said say them, but there are a few more I'd like to say. <laughs> 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 and that is the stove that I'm wearing, which I've saved for over 60 years, because I'm a pack rat, <laughs> was originally woven in the weaving studio by John, Jim St. John, who was also from Memphis, Tennessee, where I have two Southerners here at the same time. <laughs> and uh, it was white, and they called it the year of the white soul. And what it was was that you had an elective one day a week that you could work in any studio. And of course, all the guys from the architecture department went to the weaving studio because that's where all the, the girls, girls were. were yeah. <laughs> And Jim gave this to me, and I've kept it. It was a pure white, but then it began to age like I have, and I dyed it black, and I thought it would be most appropriate to bring it back to Cranbrook. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we're going to tell you a bit about this book journey that started about three years ago. Um, it seemed to us that recognition of Jerry among design iconoclasts had gone missing, and we wanted to put Jerry back in the public eye where she certainly uh, deserved a place. And so we had to go through, if you can imagine, a treasure trove of documents and photos and letters and drawings and sketches and models and photos and publications and letters that luckily Jerry had held on to. I said I was a pack rat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a hoard, hoarder of a sort. Uh, so just in case you haven't seen it upstairs or here or holding it in your hand, this is the book. It's a jam-packed 224-page volume brimming with images organized into three sections. Oh, that's right. I forget. Yeah, I, so we, I forget. Yeah, there <laughs> it is. No, the first section, early years, um, some of this Susan talked about, covers her education in Memphis followed by MFA studies here at Cranbrook, 
uh, where she was immersed in an ethos of design without disciplinary boundaries. It also includes the beginnings of her career in the styling division of General Motors and her move to Los Angeles to become director of interiors at Victor Bruin Associates. Section two focuses on the main part of Jerry's career. It starts in 1964 when Jerry formed her office, Jerry Kavanaugh Designs, in a studio space that she shared with the architect, Frank Gehry and Greg Walsh. It includes the multitude of diverse projects that she undertook from store interiors, offices, and residencies, residences, textiles and papers, wrapping papers, furnitures, exhibitions, toys and products, to graphics, and so, so much more. It's a long section. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. The third and final section, Jerry's World, shares her more personal work, the delightful handcrafted objects, her own homes that were playgrounds for ideas, and finally, her stunningly beautiful and colorful still life drawings. Throughout the book are lively anecdotes from those who have worked with Jerry and have often become lifelong friends. Their stories help to give the reader a better sense of Jerry's indomitable personality. Also included throughout the book are a few of the many, 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 many articles about Jerry and her work, um, including ones that appeared in the LA Times, House Beautiful and Cosmopolitan, as well as Interiors and Women's Wear Daily. And finally, adding fun and flair throughout the book and numerous delightful photographs of this many hued personality. And Tippy. Tippy. Yes, and Tippy Tippy. So that's the book, but as we have Jerry here today, we thought it would be a great opportunity to talk to her about some of the particular themes um, that seem to be fitting of this locale. Um, so we'll cover Cranbrook, interiors, textiles and papers, and flower and nature. Um, behind us, as you've already seen, we have this looping slideshow of images. Um, so if you miss an image, it will come back around, so don't fret. Um, the presentation and discussion will be uh, about 30 minutes, and then we'll have time, 10 minutes or so, for Q&A. Then the book signing. Shoot. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> so. <laughs> You began studies in the design program here at Cranbrook in 1951 and graduated in 1952, uh, the third woman to receive an MFA in design. Um, again and again, you've exclaimed about the unique education that you received and its impacts on your career. Can you describe what the early experience at Cranbrook was like? Well, I will tell you, that oh, when I arrived here and everyone got their studio and a place to sleep and you knew where the cafeteria was and that was in a three week period that, that was told us and to figure out and so concept that she gathered all of us which was about including some outsiders, about 125 students, and that was it. And he said to all of us, if you don't know why you're here and what you want to do, please leave by tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and that put the fear uh, in a great way into all of us, because we mostly worked in the studios until nine o'clock when the, uh, the uh, guards came by. But if we wanted permission to work longer, then you went to the registrar's office to say we would be in the studio until 12 o'clock. And then we had to get out. And usually what happened is we tried to get to the barbecue on Woodward Avenue where all the chaps from the Saranen office hung out. <laughs> <laughs> and so we would get the holy word of what Arrow said. And it was Kevin Roach who mostly told us, 
and, and also uh, Sandy McIntosh, who was still working there. And I, we would say, well, what happened? What, what did you do today? And they would say, well, we would say, yes, arrow, no arrow. We think that's very good, Errol, and that was the conversation <laughs> that we got. So, and it was always something interesting happening around here. And also, you were required by Zoltan Stepeshi to visit every studio at least once a week. And you earned so much by osmosis that it was, it's, staggering to me, and it sort of gave you permission to do anything, and that's what happened to me. So you, you, you started to answer my next question, which was about when you went to visit the other studios. Yes. Like, what happened when you did those visits? Like, for instance, when you went to furniture design. Well, there wasn't furniture design. Oh, okay. There was no division, and I would like to make that very clear because that's how you learn. It was not niche. It was a general education. And you figured out what if you wanted to do a chair, fine. If you were in ceramics and you wanted to do a chair, or if you were in architecture and you wanted to do ceramics, you could do these as long as you clean up your mess. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the sort of golden rule. And uh, there were so many things to learn here. And it opened your eyes to such a bigger world. And also, here in the Detroit area, it was really the center of the universe of modernism. There was the Saarinen office, the Yamasaki office, the Gruen office, Alexander Gerard, and the Detroit Art Institute, and the Ford Museum. Now, that's a pretty heady group of people. And, I, and we all thought, that's just how the normal world worked, <laughs> was all of that. It was a very exciting time to be here. And there were a lot of exciting people. I remember, I was, after I left school, I met Fukio Maki, who was from Japan. And he, I then later met again at a lecture in Los Angeles, and I went up to him, and I said, you were the year after I was at Cranbrook. And he then lit up, and he said, I took a boat from Tokyo to Seattle. From Seattle, I took a train to, to, uh, to Chicago. From Chicago, I took another train to Detroit. And from Detroit, I took a bus out to Cranbrook. <laughs> and he was so elated that somebody talked to him about this. And the American, he is one of the number one architects in Japan and has done also a lot of work in this country. And there were so many other people like him that it just, it just rubbed off on you. Interesting. So I wanted to ask you about textile design. Because yeah. you came here with an experience in textile yes. design from Memphis. Yeah. And at, so you worked with Marianne Stringell. No, I didn't work okay. with Marianne. I, Mary Ann was a great supporter of okay. me. She was, and she was always willing to talk to me or something. And it was interesting to see what Mary Ann was developing for the General Motors Tech Center. And a couple of years ago, I gave Chris, what's his last name, who was the director, the, uh, uh, the sample of the rugs that were woven by Marion's team, I think somewhere up in Pontiac, mm -hmm. and they are treasures to me, I mean, the whole idea. And I also found uh, for them, if they wanted to do it, a rug uh, fabricator who was from the Himalayas uh, to, uh, uh, oh, Stephanie Odegaard. And, but nothing came out of it, and I wish 
General Motors one of these days would reproduce those bugs. So was there, when I, when I look at your, the array of your yeah. thesis projects, you know, the textiles really stand out. Yeah. Did you feel like that was your strength, your greatest strength? No, I didn't because I got exposed to so many other things. Mm -hmm. And I did my first chair here and I did my second piece of the furniture, and I also did children's illustration books yes. here, yes. besides mm -hmm. textual, yes, and I also did a mosaic, and that was in a collective group of us. Once a year, they would have somebody from the architecture to the design department, ceramic, textile, work as a team. And that's where I got the sensibility of how you would do that, what I call in the outside world. It was very interesting. But I do like textiles, there's no question. Textiles and color, I really adore. And they're such fascinating, deep subjects. And they now know that textiles predated the Bronze Age. Mm -hmm. And it up until about uh, some maybe 10 years ago, and you talk to any architect, and they were always, no, it was architecture, wrong. They found the <laughs> evidence. No, I'm but serious about this. And they also have found the evidence of textiles predating. And what it was is not the textiles themselves, but they found prints of it in uh, the clay or dirt, and they also found the bobbins for the original textiles, and they also found out about the trade that existed in textile, which is a fascinating subject, which was not uh, 20 years ago or even 30 years ago, and a lot of that research was done by a lady who taught at Occidental College. And uh, I'll right think of her. Yeah, yeah. Obama spent some yeah. time. And I'll mm -hmm. think of her name. I can't think of everything at once. It's like <laughs> well, a log jam. It's amazing how much you do remember, Jerry. Yeah. So we're going to go on to the next section. Okay. Interiors. Yeah, interiors. Um, <laughs> In 1952, you joined General Motors and were designing trade shows and model kitchens for Frigidaire. Then, in 1960, you moved to Los Angeles to become the head of interiors at Victor Gruen Associates. It was there that you were introduced to the culturally momentous Joseph Magnum stores that shifted the shopping experience, as you put it, from chic chic to chic fun. In 1964, you went on to form your own office, Jerry Kavanagh Designs, designing even more Magnum stores, as well as residential offices, residential and office interiors, amongst many, many other things. First question. Yeah, oh, what did you say last? Because I didn't bring my hair Oh, hair. OK. I'm going <laughs> to even louder and even quiet. Uh, 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 one of the first things you worked on at GM was serving as liaison between the Saarinen office and GM you on the interior designs earlier. of the tech center. Yes, for example, the, the Batoya diamond chair. Uh, which you can tell us more about if you have anything more. But could you tell us about that whole first experience? Well, the, I mean, at the tech center, mm -hmm. that yeah. was a, a fantastic experience because you could practically do anything as long as it passed by Leroy Keeper. And also, I had a fabulous studio head, and that was Carl Banker. And his daughter went here for a while to the weaving. And, and there was so much going on from designing executives of kitchens and houses. We did one house for Tony Di Lorenzo, who, who was the PR person. His was the PR person for the whole of General Motors Tech Center. And we did his house up, I think it was in Flint. And the, the interesting thing about that was a Sunday afternoon up there, 
And guess who we flew a kite with? Uh, I don't know. You're going to have to tell us. Von Braun, who <laughs> was the person from Germany that they scooped out of Germany, who was working on for Hitler on the bomb. And they didn't get the material that they brought up here. But these are the things that happened. And we also did another man uh, out, and that was uh, the oh, 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 the Roger Keys. And this is what you all have bought for your archives. And I'm very delighted. And I, they sent me this year sometime a drawing. And they said, could you tell us, Jerry, who did this? And I said, it had just seen me. That was Carl Banker. But in relationship to Carl and I designing this Frigidaire <laughs> kitchen, which GM owned, we went to New York and got some glasses from George Jensen. And we thought these would be beautiful glasses in Roger T's house, and we presented them to Roger T. And he looked at them and he goes, oh no, we can't use those. And Carl and I sort of mouth flew open. And we said, why? He says, we only give our guests jelly glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to understand, that's how jelly was sold, was in glasses with a metal lid on it. <laughs> we <laughs> roared <laughs> laughing. He could have bought oh, George Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jerry, you told me a wonderful story about the Chrome Bertoia oh. chair. Oh, yeah. So, can you tell us the story? You were working with the Saarinen office. No, well, as, we as were. Liaison. Well, we were also <laughs> working with Hans Noel uh -huh. because. The chair with the big bowl in the back really got into production because of General Motors buying it for all the offices. And secondly, when I came and was working for Carl, they decided that they had to have one comfortable chair, but different from the other old chair in all the studios. And so it was brought in, and it was in black enamel. And I jokingly said to Carl Banker, wouldn't it be fun to have a chrome-plated chair <laughs> in General Motors styling? And he didn't laugh at me. He said, call up Hans Knoll and tell him to send you one strip down, and we will chrome-plate it here. And so that's what happened. They sent it was stripped down, and we sent it to the chrome room, plating room, at Stifling, and they chrome plated. And here it is today, and I'm sitting on it. Yeah, the, the one yeah. that doesn't have the cover on it. Yeah, but this is also chrome plated yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. But it's funny, I'm sitting on it today. <laughs> That's over 50, A few years well, about 60 years ago. <laughs> and it's been in that production since production time. Um, one of the questions we wanted to ask you um, was how you compare Detroit to Los Angeles as places oh, for design. How do you compare Detroit and Los Angeles as places that design? Well, things? there are two different things. Because uh, when I went out to California, there was naturally the Grogan office and they also the Eames office. And there was also California Design, which was sponsored by the Pasadena Museum. And that created a lot of fermentation with design. And there are a series of books that were put out by the Pasadena Museum on California Design. I think there are something like six of them. They're now treasured. And that was so much to be involved in that, and the also in the Gruen organization. Because working for the Gruen organization was like working for the UN. 
there were so many different nationalities, people that came out of Hungary who had to walk through snow to die, people from China, and it was the first office in Los Angeles that hired black architects. So it was a really, and we had so much fun. We had to, through Carl Van Leuven, he bought these, uh, what are they, one piece jersey dresses and all the females in the office had to wear them. Really? <laughs> yeah. And then the guys all wore happy coats. Yeah, so that was that kind of atmosphere. Yeah, I remember you saying that you felt like there was an equality between women and men, even. You, there was an equality between the men and the women yes, in the office. Yes, there was. And you also, if you did something, uh, you immediately took it into Rudy Bonfield, who was one of the principals of the place, and somebody who evolved out of that, which I think about 80% of you all in this audience worked for some company that have sat in the air and chair. Well, that was John Chadwick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I still see John every once in a while. So there was that kind of fermentation. The fermentation is really interesting. It can be anywhere if you prod it. And everywhere you go, you should prod it. But you were in these two vital cities. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I was. Should we go to the next question? Okay, we'll go to the next question. Thank you. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about textiles and papers. Um, you started working with textiles, as we mentioned earlier, yes. when you were quite young, and your devotion to textiles yes. and papers has lasted your lifetime. Um, so one particularly significant and long-term client was Isabel Scott, yeah, right. um, Isabel Scott Fabrics, and you started working with in the late 1950s while you were here in Detroit, and you later not only did textiles for them, but graphics as well. Um, your most significant project with Isabel Scott was the Corio silk and cat fabric that you developed in the late 1960s in South Korea. Yeah. Yes, so can you tell us well, about that? Well, that was a very interesting situation because the Korean War was over about 10 years. The U.S. government was so afraid that China was going to fall to the communists, and they felt that they had to put money into some area of Southeast Asia to have things produced. Korea was a likely place. And through a set of circumstances, I met Thomas Jefferson Coolidge, who was of the Coolidge family, and of the president. And he first went in there because of a cousin, Cabot Lodge, and said, go into and try to start developing something in South Korea. And that was, he went in and developed fertilizer and made a lot of money. But he couldn't take money out of Korea like a lot of other Southeast Asia countries. It had to be taken out in products. And so he realized that the second crop for the farmers was silk ones. And so there was these silk places in northern Korea. And I went to a place called Chuncheon, which was very near the DMZ border, and started, I developed ECOT silk in production. Prior to that, it was basically done in Indonesia on strap looms by Jim Thompson. And that's another long story. And I really had a very interesting time. I never, w but I was cold. And it was the coldest I've ever been was in Korea. And I backed up against an, what you call an onion stove. And I burnt a V in the back of my coat <laughs> and had to travel 
<laughs> war and over to Japan. And uh, so <laughs> you think this is cold? It's nothing to compare <laughs> to Korea. But I, it was very interesting, and I, I have all samples of that silk, and it did win one international prize for textiles, and some of it is in the Fashion Institute in uh, New York, and I can't, I'm crossing my fingers, it might wind up in the Textile Museum in, at George Washington University, which is, they just built two years ago a new uh, facilities for the Textile Museum. And it, here, of course, on this side of the Mississippi, as I say, you should go there <laughs> and see it. It's an amazing place. So, Jerry, in the, in the 1970s, you started your own textile line. Yes. Jerry, uh, this is fabric. one of us. Yes, yeah. we're so glad you wore that today. Yeah. <laughs> so, how did you decide to start your own line? It's something I had an itching to do but uh, I was not successful. I not only lost my shirt, I practically lost my underwear too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, you know, I'm not embarrassed by saying that, but uh, I, as a result of the sideline, I was designing paper goods for a company in San Francisco. <laughs> Instead of becoming the textile queen of LA, I became the paper napkin queen of LA. <laughs> <laughs> because I signed all, had a signature on these paper napkins that were produced by Monogram. And they were first sold at NK department store in Sweden before they were sold locally. But I met along the way Rudy Gernrich and he looked at the napkin and he looked at me again. He says, oh, you designed these. And he then uh, proceeded to tell me how he bought them at this liquor store. And I was very <laughs> grateful for the royalties that came <laughs> out. That's, that's very nice, the royalties yes, from the yes. liquor store. Right. Yeah. Um, can you tell us more about the Bill Tellinger wallpapers? Because those are particularly Oh, beautiful. that was really interesting. Bill Kilior was an American who was originally born of missionary people in China. So he had a love for the Orient and he had a love for Japan. And he produced a wabasabi paper, which the soku screens are all made out of, that was why. And then he took uh, the stencil that they use for producing textiles, particularly the indigo textiles, and he made them, this, uh, these are, cutouts about this line and combine that with uh, stenciling of gold leaf and then also doing a silk screen over it. And I used those in a, ex not exhibition, but in a, a department, a specialty shop called Joseph Magnus. And I recently, had somebody call me up and wanted to know about it, more about it, but I never heard back from him. But it was an interesting innovation of taking something from the past and making it viable for the future. It, it, and I did, I think, about four designs from him. And How did I you meet him? Well, I you met everybody in LA in the same <laughs> way here. These people would come through town and you would meet them and naturally you'd get chatting with them and you usually wound up saying, oh, I can do something, you know, and you did. Yeah. And so I was invited to come to Japan and I <laughs> stayed with Barbara and Bill Kiliur in Kyoto. Yeah, it was wow. very interesting. And 
the papers were produced out on Lake Biwa. On what? Lake at Lake Biwa. That's a very famous lake outside of Kyoto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep talking around, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> um, should we go on to the next All question? right, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Just have to find my paper. <coughs> All right. Uh, we're fin finally going to talk about uh, flowers and nature, um, which is one of my favorite areas of your work. This was in Detroit, a suburb of Detroit. Yes. See, and I told you we'd have some surprises yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it d it do does it still exist? It doesn't, what? It doesn't still exist, right? No. no. It no. was in a small shopping <laughs> center that at Louis Redstone <laughs> design. And Louis Redstone also before me, he went to Cranbrook. I don't know how long he stayed with me, but it was Louis Redstone. And of course, at that time, because of the tech center, glazed brick was very popular. I love glazed brick. And most people don't know that the brick that was used on the tech center had not been used until from the Mesopotamian times. And I have a catalog that I got at a book fair in LA that shows the exhibition of that, the, uh, gate, the King's Gate in Mesopotamia. So it's, these things all have mm -hmm. finally links. It's sort of like something is here and it fades away and then it comes up again and it fades away. So. Don't throw anything away. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm gonna move my questions around then. Um, we were actually looking at your thesis. What? We were looking at your thesis today uh, over in the library. And uh, I'm gonna read you something that you wrote in your early 20s. Uh, you wrote, design is an accumulation of everything you perceive. It is, take all, it is all taken in, chewed up and digested and stored for a future time. When the proper time comes, an idea is born of this, which is basically what you were just saying. Yes, yes. It's a kind of amazing that you've kind of had the same philosophy your entire life. C could you just expand well, on I that? Well, I wasn't going to throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> it did get me somewhere. Yeah. But to, to know that when you're in your 20s, to know something that, that resonates your well, part career. of that was due because my father was a rare book dealer. And so I grew up with that a kind of philosophy about books. And so I was, you know, always associating my growing up with the mentality of books. Mm -hmm. So it. But also where you first in encountered a lot of nature. Yes, yeah. I did. Yes. I did. Edgy, can you tell us a little bit about? I know you have some stories about sort of your early childhood and nature and animals and that zoo that the zoo that was opposite your house. Could you what? just the zoo, the zoo that was opposite your house? Oh yeah, I yes. grew up in Memphis, across the street from the Overton Park Zoo, and so it was very much because I used to walk to school through the zoo because the school was on the other side. And the last words as I was going down the steps of the house to, to go to school through the zoo, don't pet the lions, you know what happened to Mr. Melroy. <laughs> <laughs> he had a few fingers missing. Oh, no. <laughs> oh my God. He had some fingers missing. And, uh, and also, I remember something that I love to tell to people, is I remember when I was maybe five or six years old, of my parents waking me up at night. And I heard these incredible sounds coming from the zoo, because the zoo was right across the street. And it was like, a symphony of sounds of the animals. A lion would roar, and then you'd hear a peacock, and then you'd hear the monkey screeching, but it was like a symphony. And my parents wanted me to hear that. 
And later on, my father, who was a great in innovator in, in, uh, in seeking out things, found out from somebody that they had found out that animals that were in captivity would every once in a while collectively revert to their sounds of what we call the jungle. So all of that up in here. Wow, yeah. that's really cool. Um, you, Jay, one more question or should yeah. we wrap up? Okay. Yeah, let's ask one more. It's just about the super puppets. Okay, okay. So you have, <laughs> a, you have a tendency to create or imagine super scaled flowers and animals such as the pigeon benches that you created when you received the City of Los Angeles Artist Fellowship in 2000. Oh, are you talking about these? Uh, well, the, pi no, the pigeon benches. You know the, the really beautiful um, stainless the steel bench? Award. The pigeon benches that you created. It's in oh, here somewhere. Oh, the pigeon. So that was yeah. the Cola Award. I finally got a Cola Award, which the award was uh, collectively $100,000, and there were 10 awards given of $10,000 each. You could spend it on any art project. You could not travel with it, and you could not do anything to your studio or to your house. You had to produce something. And I always wanted to do something with these benches and I was very much influenced by Edgar Adamson, who was from Nashville, Tennessee. He was a black artist. And he was like the Brancusi of the folk art world. And so he was my inspiration to develop these, I called them at that time, pigeon benches, because that was also in Memphis. Court Square, where all the pigeons flock. And then when I started developing it, a landscape architect friend of mine said, uh-uh, Jerry, you can't call them pigeons anymore because nobody likes pigeons. How about calling them dove benches? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm still looking for a square or a plaza where I could put a flock of them on. They weigh 600 pounds, <laughs> and they are out of cast iron. And I tried to have them produced in LA because the award came from the LA Department of Cultural Affairs, yeah. and I thought it was right to spend the money back in LA. Mm -hmm. And so this is a mock-up of that I did. And there is one that I did a bigger mock-up in the uh, Japanese plaza downtown. And the pigeon now, pigeon, the dove, rests in my front yard. And yes. <laughs> it's a good thing it's, it's heavy. Or yeah, we so know no, a few people who might steal it. Well, you can't yeah. sleep on it. You can't sleep under it. <laughs> yeah. But it does make a great place to sit down and contemplate. Yeah. Well, Jerry, we know you have so many stories, and we have a feeling that this audience has a lot of questions for you as well. So we're going to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we now have a few minutes for questions. OK. Oh. Yeah. You know, and the influence that it might have had at the time that you were here at Cranbrook. Did the Bauhaus have influence here? No. 
It didn't. <laughs> no, it didn't. The bow, it was the bow house sort of went down, and it was sort of like the new world of what was happening here. Uh, if anything up there was influenced, would have been Le Corbusier. And I think he was, color-wise, was a direct influence on Warren Platner on the General Motors styling building and the whole complex. Yes. It's not the, the Bauhaus right now is up again because people are writing about it and people are going there. And there's nothing wrong in that. It's great. Yes, sir. <laughs> But he can work at that. Did, did you consider ergonomics at all when you were designing, say, furniture? <laughs> no, I was getting lots of no's. <laughs> uh, you have to understand, no. I'm a person that just does it. I, there's a lot of stuff maybe way back in my head, but to go out and, it, because ergonomics at that time, really hadn't hit. It wasn't until much later ergonomics hit as a general atmosphere. Yeah, I always think of your work as sort of designed for delight. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's to nothing to wrong in no, that. Nothing wrong. <laughs> well, the lights are still on. Yeah. Yes. What were your difficulties trying to run a textile company? What? What were your difficulties trying to run a textile company? I, I didn't really know enough about business, and I didn't really know enough about promotion. And the promotion came, as it is in the book, not at the beginning. It was when I really needed it. And also, there was a mentality which still exists in retail, they give you three months, and if it doesn't click, the next person comes in. And I had that happen with me with CB2. Yeah, so you recently had some, some products produced by CB2. By CB2, which sold by Craig Barrow. Yeah, and the, what they don't have, these companies, which somehow should be solved, is they don't have a designer making decisions. All they usually have are people that can count beans. <laughs> and that really happened seriously at around uh, 1981 with the coming in of the computer. The computer is great, but the computer doesn't know how to ask the question. And the MBAs, were taught how to add things up, but they were never taught how to spin the beans <laughs> to, for the next generation. There was a very interesting article uh, about maybe six weeks or two months ago that was in the New York, Sunday New York Times about a Dutchman who came to this country and became one of the heads of one of the major corporations. And he explained that, of how we have missed the boat in not training people of how to spend the money for the future. Because the money today is spent driven by the stockholders. Yes. And, and there's nothing wrong in any of these systems if we would just use them right. And I can tell you it's that. It's you in charge, Jerry. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, I'm serious about it because there's so many things that we have that are fantastic, but we aren't, haven't gotten to using them right, not for the future. And the future 
is all of us. Any other questions? Yeah, I think one more question and then we'll go on to the book signing or maybe people want to just jump in. Okay. The last question is kind of specific. Um, I love your pigeon benches. Um, so I was wondering, I, I was really surprised you said you couldn't get them anywhere in LA. Did you consider the renovations on the LA River? I think they would be what it tastes like excellent it. there. So she said uh, the, the pigeon benches, yeah. the, the dove. Yeah. Um, did you consider talking to Frank about maybe they should go on the LA River renovation project? Forget it. <laughs> I love Frank. I really <laughs> love him. He was so much like a big brother. But there are so many things at this point that have to be solved on that particular project. That it, it's like that is the last piece of whipped cream yes. on a project. And usually what happens is that it's a project is budgeted and then somewhere along the line, the price of something goes up and the budget for the art piece goes into getting the other thing like steel or concrete or something solved. I love Frank, but I know that won't happen. And it's not being derogatory against Frank, it's the system. I love the joy and optimism of you and your work forever. <laughs> yeah. oh, the what? Yeah. <laughs> what? What did she say? I didn't learn anything. Yeah. We love the joy and the optimism of you forever. <laughs> Well, it means a lot to me to be here in a lot of ways. I mean, to pass the studio where I work, to see the room that I live in, and Barbara Ludorowski and Barbara Simpson, who was across the hall and would wake me up at night so that she could have somebody to talk to, that she had something. And I'd want to strangle her, but she became a very good friend. And she started the Mattress Museum in Pittsburgh, which is one of the unique museums, I think, of this country. Yeah. Because they will bring an artist in, show them a room in the mattress factory, and say, what would you like to do with it? They come back with a proposal and go out and get some money to produce it. So, yeah, that was... It's very unique. It's, uh, I think, more that should be done than, than what the museums of this country have done for the raising the equality of life. I'm serious about this. It's, and it should be not just one book, but it should be constantly written about what it has an effect I've gotten so I will read something about uh, an exhibition and say, okay, I'll give it a, a year to two years and I'll see where there's some effect. And you can, you can do that. And it's very important to me, these museums doing these different things. And I think it's terrific that Graphic design has been elevated, and that's through the walker. <laughs> there is a walker and pentagram that was, that was done. And I understand that an exhibition here in Detroit is going to be on car designing. We heard about this today when we went down to the Detroit, the DAI, as they call it here. And I think that because it raises the standard of the uh, attitude, the, uh, and there's more than that of t taking a serious look at these things. And not just, a, uh, uh, as we used to call it, a commission officer's idea of what things should be done. There's so many things. 
that can be raised through the museum. And so, cheers to you all. Would you like to join us over yes, here? Yes, I guess I will. <laughs> if I can hobble over in a full.